Why don't we talk a little about, about uh, post-operative changes uh, in the shoulder? Please, John, uh, your goodest will join us. Uh, so a typical bank cart repair, you have a tear and displacement of the anterior uh, labrum here. And typically with the bank cart repair, you put in around three suture anchors, is a pretty typical number. I put the suture anchors in, tie the suture anchors to the labrum and bring it back down, roughen up the edges so that hopefully you can get biologic healing between the bone and, and the labrum because the sutures won't last forever and try to get uh, repair. Hi, John. Hi, I just got uh, north. Good. Okay, we're just started. And uh, do you want to have say any comments about a surgical bank cart repair? Um, well, one thing, it's easier to do it arthroscopically than to do it uh, the regular old-fashioned way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, because it's very difficult to get to that area without, uh, without having suture anchors. Okay. Uh, but uh, not every condition uh, of the shoulder uh, um, works with the van card repair. You have to go by what what you find in terms of uh, pathology. Sure. Uh, but I, I suspect you're going in that direction now, so I'll wait and see what you say, John. Okay. Great. All right. So this is kind of what it looks like. This is a low field scanner. This is a, an oblique sagittal <laughs> sequence, and we can see in this case metal artifact. Not all the suture anchors are metal. But here we can see metal artifact from three suture anchors in a typical location for bank cart repair. Uh, this is the axial, uh, I guess this isn't, this is a higher field. This is a PD fat sat sequence where we can see where the suture anchors are and we're losing visualization of the bone there due to the metal artifact from the suture anchors. And here's the oblique coronal images where we can see the three suture anchors uh, down here. Uh, uh, yes, John. Uh, well, that uh, that one uh, image that flew by doesn't look like the um, well, no, it, uh, the labrum is uh, back in place, but uh, I guess you got better. Well, yeah, right, yeah. right there. Right here. Like this. Yeah. Uh, my my experience is that for bank art repairs, uh, a majority of the time when we do re-imaging later. The labrum is very small, often difficult to visualize. I don't know if we just image patients who have tears, subsequent tears, uh, or though we 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 visual we've imaged some patients after surgery, and you can see a labrum sitting in this location. So in a case like this, where I do not see a labrum sitting where it's supposed to be, even though we see the operative defect then I certainly describe uh, that the, the labrum is not visualized. And uh, 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 I've had a few of those go to, to recurrent surgery. Some of them, the, the labrum has been torn. Others, the labrum has just been very degenerated and, and lost. But, but I think that when you don't see the labrum after a repair like this, uh, that's abnormal and doesn't lead to the uh, outcome that you would like. And we can see there's kind of a, uh, a large capacity to the joint well, space there's, here. There's a reason why that there's an MRI of this repair. Uh, it would seem that there is a problem with the shoulder. Yeah. Uh, clinically. Yeah. Here we can see the articular cartilage, but this is probably a displaced labrum down here. No, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. So here is another... Uh, uh, Post repair. Here we can see more of a superior suture anchor uh, in this particular case. If we go to the axial images, again, we don't see a good uh, labrum in, uh, in the area where the repair occurs. Uh, and if we look carefully more, more inferiorly, we can see that there is a tear inferior in the labr uh, in inferiorly here. And at re recurrent surgery, there was a uh, tear of the labrum here. And they said the labrum was intact here, but it was uh, atrophic. That's why you have to be prepared. Uh, that's why you have to really examine a patient well and also get MRIs 
that show that. Uh, and if you have to, you go to a 3D CT scan yeah. um, for the bony lesions um, because um, these repairs are not easy to do and there are complications, uh, not uncommonly. Uh, and so uh, uh, you don't want to have to go back and redo it. Um, and, and, and this one looks like it needs redoing. So. It, it, it's uh, something you have to give some thought to before you put the knife to the patient. Okay. So, uh, let's see here. Uh, Deshali, what do you think of this case? So, you have an axial T1 image in a patient who's had an arthrogram, and there's a suture anchor within the anterior infraglenoid, and the overlying articular cartilage. Um, it, it looks thick and more anteriorly, and the, there's not distinct low signal intensity within labrum. It's more intermediate signal, and it looks uh, irregular. So this is a post-operative repair. Um, and then so we have a PD axial, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, PD facet axial image, um, which shows this intermediate signal intensity within the anterior labral that undercuts. Uh, so, okay, so then we have a recurrent tear. Goes to, the, to the base of the insertion of the interband of the infraglenohumeral ligament as well here. Okay. Uh, uh, Jonah, what do you think of this case? All right. So here we've got a 24-year-old uh, with uh, recurrent dislocation after uh, labral surgery. Um, and, you know, on this uh, sagittal uh, image, we're seeing some uh, susceptibility artifact from those uh, suture anchors there. Um, so, so the, what they're concerned about here is should they do another arthroscopic repair or should they do something uh, bigger surgery like an open coracoid transfer uh, to get this patient to be stable. Okay. Here are the sagittal images. We can see the suture anchor placements there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Something down there. Here are the coronal images. Okay. Well, that's, that's a little bit more striking. Um, so we have, uh, have that uh, inferior portion of the lenoid, but really appears to be another uh, Bankart uh, lesion. There's okay, so, the so we see the labrum is displaced here. Uh, and also, yeah, like, there, there's a lot of attenuation of the uh, uh, capsule and glenohum inferior glenohumeral ligament origin from the humerus or attachment to the humerus. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, but here, this is uh, a displaced inferior labrum and capsular attachment. And there you can see where it should be. Here are the axial images where we can see the big defect and displacement here. So uh, uh, this is a, 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 a bony bank cart after surgery. If we go back here, you can actually see that, that there, this is a, a bone that's been displaced out here. So this is a recurrent uh, injury, and now it's a bony bank card injury uh, requiring repair. John, do you have any comments about this? Well, obviously the bank card failed, uh, so uh, now you have to re rethink about uh, what else to do. The Bristol procedure comes to mind. Um, I, I always like the Bristol. Uh, I've never been all that thrilled with Bankart, but I never did too many of them. So I'll, sh I'll show Bristol in a minute, and you can explain what that is when we get right. the images up. <laughs> okay, yeah. um, I'm saying that that, that, uh, rem rem that this uh, is healed. Uh, the bone, uh, the bone is is healed. It's obviously part of the glenoid has fractured off, so you have to bring that back and tack it down again, and that that's pretty difficult to do. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if the patient wants to go through two different procedures. And I, I knew before, but I'd forgotten exactly what they did to this, this patient after the MR. Uh, I don't know whether they tried another arthroscopic procedure uh, or not. I'm sorry, I should remember that. 
Okay. Uh, Jeff, what do you think of this case? Jeff? Is this, do you see me? Oh, okay, I, I didn't hear that. No, it's okay. uh, gotcha. Sorry, uh, 18-year-old <clears throat> status post a bank repair uh, 10 months ago. Uh, Re-injury, rule out a re-tear, and on this uh, axial PD fat set post uh, contrast imaging, and we're seeing an irregularity of the anterior inferior labrum. In fact, it looks to be displaced uh, uh, anteriorly, and uh, so, it, and I think there is a. Well, it looks like there is some marrow signal uh, within that uh, yeah. labrum there. So I think this is an osseous banker repair, yeah. a retear. Yeah, you, you'd need to kind of look at the T1-weighted image. That's markedly thickened periosteum here, and then that's where the suture anchor is. Here's the next cut where we can see displacement of the labrum, thickened of the periosteum. So this is kind of one of those thickened Perthes-type lesions another suture anchor here, but this is clearly retorn uh, after the surgery, and the tear extending up close to the superior area. And we can see an acute Hill Sachs lesion here with bone marrow edema associated with it. So these patients are at uh, real risk for, here, here's just the coronal images, are at risk for re-tear, re so that's very common. Uh, uh, one is they may have anatomy that predisposes to dislocation, the other is these athletes tend to go back to do the same activity again that caused the dislocation to begin with, uh, so they're at high risk. Uh, Max, what do you think of this case? Max, are you with us? Oh, you can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, okay, perfect. Okay, so, all right, so we have an, uh, an axial uh, T1 and uh, sagittal uh, T1 images here. Yeah, this is T2. Okay. Oh, T2, okay. Uh, so, uh, let's see. There is a dark signal overlying the glenoid. Right. Um, okay. Presuming that's a surgical uh, repair. Okay. And uh, Here are the coronals. Yeah, and, so and, there's... And where's the metal artifact centered? It's uh, along the inferior glenoid. Um, it's really the anterior glenoid right around the okay. anterior glenoid. And this is a Bristol procedure. Uh, John, do you want to tell us what a Bristol procedure is and why it's used for anterior dislocation? Um, uh, yeah, um, Bristol was a, a professor of orthopedic surgery in, in, uh, in South Africa. I think it was Jonestown or wherever. But anyway, his uh, resident, um, described the procedure and uh, but he didn't give his own name he uh, in honor of his teacher he named it the Bristol procedure uh, what that entails is taking down uh, um, a coracoid process um, about a, almost a half of an inch of it uh, with, with the with the tendons uh, coracobrachialis and, and biceps short head as well as the ligament the coracal uh, um, uh, humeral okay. yeah. and, and then transferring it to the anterior aspect anterior inferior aspect of the glenoid neck just um, just uh, medial to uh, the uh, to the uh, glenoid after you um, and the modern te technique, which has been modified quite a bit uh, from the old one, in the old technique that was described, all he did was split the subscapularis tendon and put the bone and the tendons and um, sutured the tendon uh, in front of the in front of the uh, glenoid. He didn't drill a hole in in, in the glenoid uh, neck and put a screw in there. Really? Uh, what, what he did was just put in a bone block with the tendons. So it's been modified, and I, I modified it myself, actually, uh, and I used a screw that's used for uh, uh, chromioclavicular separations, uh, which has wide uh, threads in it, and that became my favorite procedure years ago. 
Uh, anyway, what I would do is I split the tendon and I cut it um, transversely, a subscapularis, uh, then denude the um, glenoid um, um, medial portion of the neck uh, enough to accept the bone block with the tendons attached in the in the coracal um, uh, humor ligament and um, pre-drill um, the coracoid before removing it and then remove it after you put a screw in it and, and, and then have a hole already to place the bone block and, and after you repair it that way uh, the bone block heals bone to bone uh, the, the, the screw that I use tightens it really really well and has a large uh, head to it so that it, it doesn't uh, the bone doesn't slip through it and it, it gives you an excellent repair and of course then you reattach this subscapularis muscle where it belongs and, and you can imbricate it tightening the uh, subscap uh, tendon uh, in other words uh, giving it a little extra scar tissue there what that does then and you have a bone block and you also have a sling of the subscapularis uh, down below that prevents it from dislocating so it's kind of a double uh, uh, repair not, not, not just putting a bone block but also tightening the anterior capsule and your inferior aspect and, and whatever else is there Thank you, John. Great. So that's and only one, one, one dislocation was a neighbor of mine. He was a druggie. Uh, my ex office manager's brother and lived in my neighborhood about a half a block away. And he was, um, he was a lot of drugs. Uh, eventually wound up in jail. I don't know where he is now. But uh, I reduced his shoulder on my dining room table. When he, while he was um, out surfing, he, he fell with an outstretched arm and dislocated it uh, and um, wound up in my house with an arm hanging down. And that, that procedure failed. That's the only one failed in about, I'd say about 25 or 30 procedures. Wow. Good. But, Thank you. You were not a good patient, I'll tell you. <laughs> Dashali, what do you think of this one? Okay, so you have a frontal radiograph, the left shoulder, and there's this aspheric density that's anterior to the glenoid. Um, so what do you think that is? So the increase, this that increased density into the glenoid could be because of uh, it could be sclerosis um, related to an old fracture. Um, I can't yeah, I see would, the humeral head very well. I would think of it as a fracture first of all. When once you, you certainly want to rule it out. And then um, we have axial T1 and PD fat set images. Um, and on the T1 weighted images, or at the T1 weighted image, there's uh, intermediate signal intensity of the anterior labrum. Um, and then there's also, uh, I don't see any low signal intensity um, adjacent to it, so this may be a remote um, hill sex fracture. This is more inferiorly placed. And then more inferiorly. Um, it's a low-field scan, and this is gradient echo on the right, T1 on the left. So there's this intermediate signal intensity globular lesion um, anterior to the glenoid. Um, yeah, so, so, so displaced... You have an interruption of the cortex here. Okay. So this is, as John said, it was a low So this is a hand... This patient had an acute anterior dislocation. Not have acute bone marrow edema at the hill sax lesion, but has an acute fracture the anterior inferior glenoid. Okay. So this is a bony bank. Oops. Oh. Way back, way back when, when all we had was x-rays. Uh, that's all we had to go by. 
and we always thought that what you're looking at on the x-ray was a fracture uh, and had to be ruled out. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, oops. Uh, let's see, uh, Jonah, what do you think of this case? Yes, well, we've got a couple of uh, axial, I guess, PDFS images and a sagittal image of this uh, patient's uh, shoulder. Uh, we're seeing a lot of um, edema of the uh, posterior lateral humeral head, which uh, would correspond with a uh, Hillsex uh, lesion. And uh, then we're also seeing what appears to be a uh, fracture of the um, anterior glenoid there, um, a little bit lower down and also on the uh, sagittal, so, um, yeah. Okay. So, so how, the, how, uh, how, much of, how much of the glenoid is fractured? About 40 percent. Yeah, so that, that's, that's important. Yeah. Uh, and John will tell us in a moment. <laughs> so again, yeah, I, I would also say it's probably about uh, 40 percent in that range. And what percentage did we say the, the other day was significant that usually means that you have to have surgical intervention. Well, it should be anything over 25 percent, right? Yeah, 25 percent or greater. Some people use 20 percent or greater, but most of the literature is 25 percent or greater. So, so this is one where you need to get on the phone and have to seriously consider a surgical stabilization of a fragment this large. <laughs> confused as to why we think it's 40% because to me if we look at the surface area on the sagittal image it looks like it's less than a quarter of it. Yes. It's, again, it's not surface area that you're measuring. It's linear. So if you measure the distance from here to there and the distance from there to there, uh, this is all, this, the, the fracture line here is almost at 50% of the width. So this is about 40% and this is about 60%. So it's that percentage that's important. Or in other ways, you take this, the distance from there to there and the distance from here to here. And if you measure this distance and measure that distance, I think you'll find that this distance is more than a quarter of the sum of the two. And therefore, this would be in a category. And if you just look at this also, if, if you if you assume that this became an unstable fragment that didn't fuse properly, and you're just left with this much articulating surface, you would guess that this would be very unstable. You also have some loose fragments in there. But but the thing is, uh, I'm not sure I would go along with the 20 and 25 percent. I think anything that uh, that is displaced, uh, and there's a fracture of the glenoid, I, 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 Although I'm a very conservative guy, I would uh, put a screw in that. Yeah. Um, that makes sense to me. That's an ideal time to do it. Yeah, in the acute phase. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about injuries to the posterior aspect to the greater tuberosity. We've seen it being a hill sex, erosions or at the insertion of the infraspinatus, and posterior impingement as the typical findings there. This is the Typical acute heel sacs. We saw this case before. This is acute. This is uh, later after the bone is healed and you get rid of the bone marrow edema. So this is a chronic heel sacs, which we commonly see, and this is more acutely right after it's occurred. Uh, and here's a patient with chronic anterior, anterior instability, and we see a lot of irregularity, that posterior aspect of the greater tuberosity. Here the uh, labrum looks pretty normal. Uh, kind of superiorly, but if we go anteriorly, it's markedly truncated. Uh, this looks like a chronic lesion here, and this is the appearance of a chronic long-standing anterior uh, labral, uh, labral tear where a lot of the labrum just gets resorbed. In this case, the articular cartilage is intact, but you have a chronic anterior labral mm -hmm. tear, and that uh, uh, leads to the patients being unstable. So uh, now, th 
this is also a, a case where we can see irregularity of the posterior aspect of the greater tuberosity. This was a Major League Baseball shortstop uh, player. player. Uh, and here, this, this has a different configuration. It's not that V-shaped configuration that we typically see with, with a hill sacs impaction injury. This patient did not have a history of anterior dislocations, but this is the area where you have the overlap infraspinatus and supraspinatus fibers which attach to the posterior aspect of the greater tuberosity, which we've talked over and over about. And this is chronic tug injury uh, in that location where the bone is actually weaker than the tendon insertions. And this is really a chronic traction injury, and we see this all the time. I think we probably see it in everybody over the age of about 40 or 45, uh, but we see it much uh, earlier and younger athletes who do a lot of overhead activity. So that's just the traction injury of the, and this is what it looks like on the sagittal images. And if you go on, this can, this can lead to chronic injury and chronic cyst formation, which we see this is all secondary to chronic repetitive traction injury. Okay, now, Okay, and here's a situation where we can see uh, an impaction injury. Uh, this looks a lot like a hill sac V-shaped injury. Now this is in an Aberview uh, image, and, and this person, he had no history of anterior dislocations. What we can see is fraying of the posterior capsule, which is really the infraspinatus insertion uh, in this particular area. In this patient, there's a loose body, which typically isn't present in these in these cases. But you can see in the ABR position, what happens in, uh, if you're actually in the throwing mechanism, repetitive throwing, is that you get an impaction from the posterior glenoid against the posterior superior humeral head in the same location where the infraspinatus atta attaches, and you can get impaction injuries that look a lot like hill sacs, but this mechanism is due to posterior impingement from repetitive banging uh, with throwers when they get into the cut position. Almost always, you'll have fraying of the uh, infraspinatus insertion in this location uh, because it's damaged by the same mechanism that the bone's damaged because they're in that same location, if you remember. We're talking about the, the area where the infraspinatus inserts. So you'll almost always get this kind of fraying. And in the overhead throwers, the... Uh, uh, catchers and pitchers in baseball, uh, quarterbacks in football, this is a typical injury that they get with posterior impingement. You don't see this in a non-athletic population. Uh, uh, John? Yes. Um, what happens, uh, what I've read and, and, and observed is that when you elevate the arm, uh, the structures like the uh, anterior um, humeral uh, ligaments, uh, they tighten yeah. uh, as you progress in, in abduction. And, uh, it, and, and of course, the capsule tightens also, uh, which is part of the whole thing anyhow. Uh, and, and what you see here is you would expect to see more, more of a, a capsule uh, and, 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 and more uh, uh, fluid in the capsule or, or the GAD in the capsule um, in a joint space. Uh, and here, it's a, a very interesting way to, to, to show somebody that, that uh, in fact, the capsule tightens as you affect the arm or elevate the arm. Okay. Because um, actually, if, if once you put the arm down, I think you'll see that uh, the capsule is much, much uh, more distended than, than what you find here. Okay. I think. Okay, good. So now let's go on. So we talked about anterior labral tears. Let's go forward and talk about posterior labral tears. And uh, they can occur with posterior dislocations. Uh, you can have posterior uh, labral periosteal sleeve avulsions, Bennett lesions, and a Kim lesion. A typical lesion. So, uh, who did the last one? Jonah, I think, or Jeff? Did you do the last I think, one? Yeah, it's my. No, it's. Uh, I think it's my turn. Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, what we have here is a 
the radiograph if yeah. failed while saving yeah. the Picasso. Yeah, the, the only reason Malaysia. I showed this was because of the history. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> now, go ahead. What do you think's going on here? Okay, uh, it's frontal radiograph, the shoulder. Uh, mm, oh. Yeah. Okay. So it looks like on this, it looks like what we have a defect. I think in the uh, in the sh in the humeral head, it appears to be the posterior superior aspect of the humeral head. Okay. So we have a slightly oblique frontal view. What we see is overlap between the humeral head and the glenoid, and then it looks like there may be kind of a groove here and the humeral head. So what does that make you concerned about? Uh, uh, I'd want to correlate the hidden history of posterior dislocation. Okay. Uh, for like a, this is like a reverse hill sac deformity. Yeah. And here, here is the uh, kind of the uh, outlet, or I mean the uh, Y view, close to it, not quite. And we're, we're not seeing the, the, the humeral head centered properly on the glenoid. Uh, it's not quite the right view. And we can see that the articulating surface of the humeral head really isn't pointed over here toward the glenoid. So this would also make us very concerned that this patient is dislocated. And then here's what the MR scan okay. looks like. So uh, we have these uh, axial, I think these are PD fat side images, and we can see that the humeral head is uh, essentially uh, impacted. The, posterior superior aspect of the humeral head is impacted on the posterior uh, glenoid and uh, there's some marrow edema there surrounding it as well uh, and on this view here we see the, the coronal view uh, again it appears that the humeral head is uh, is maybe a, there is some edema in that area as well posterior yeah. humeral head yeah. and again this uh, Looks like it's a T1 yeah. image or T2 image uh, demonstrates uh, that the same thing that the humeral head is sexually impacted. So, so, so this is a posterior dislocation. Right? Yeah, posterior dislocation. And so okay. if you can see here, remember the labrum is right in here, so you can imagine that if this patient is stuck here uh, in a posterior dislocated shoulder with bone against bone, that labrum is going to be in between. So it makes sense that if you have a posterior dislocation you're at a high risk for tearing the posterior labrum. Uh, uh, Jeff, how, how often are these missed? Uh, in terms of the, just looking at the radiograph, <laughs> well, I would imagine, radio. or clinically, and ra maybe radiographically. And radiograph. Uh, well, I think radiographically is very high. Uh, I would suspect, Scott, I think it's greater than 50%. Um, Clinically, I don't know. I'm Fifty percent in the literature uh, missed the boat on this, uh, which which can wind up in in in, in uh, severe litigation. Uh, that's a very common experience for folks. Now that, yeah, uh, that's why it's uh, it's always recommended to get three views of the shoulder, and there are, if you do three views, there are a number of ways to, to find this. Uh, one is. You can see if you try to get a Y view that you're not centered properly, like you're seeing here. If you get an axillary view, then, but you can't get, typically with these people, you can't get an axillary view. So the fact that you know you can't get an axillary view makes you uh, uh, really concerned. Or you try to get internal and external rotation views, and there's no change between the two. Uh, all that should make you uh, very concerned. So if you, if you, if you typically get three views. Yes, John. Trans thoracic view is very helpful, also. Yep, yep. So if you do the proper technique, you shouldn't miss it. But uh, there are a lot of places where people come in for acute imaging, and they'll just get two views, and they won't try to do internal external rotation or trans thoracic or an axillary view, and then you can miss it. Yeah, if it becomes chronic, it's very difficult to fix. That's the problem. Yeah. Yep. So you don't want to miss these. Uh, Max, what do you think of this case? So it's an axial CT of the right shoulder on a nine-year-old male with recurrent shoulder dislocation, which demonstrates a retroversion of the glenoid and posterior dislocation of the humeral head. Okay. And Here's the MR. 
So we got, uh, I believe the left one is a uh, uh, proton density, right? Uh, PD fat set. PD fat set axial, and this is a sagittal PD fat set. PD fat set, okay. So here we can see that the humeral head is interlocking with the posterior glenoid as well as the labrum. There's some uh, blunting of that labrum, so it looks like it's some labor injury. So it's clearly labrum. posteriorly dislocated. Yeah. So I'm just showing it very nicely. We don't see a good posterior labrum here. Uh, uh, I'm sure, it's torn and maybe displaced over over in this area. Mm -hmm. uh, now, so, okay. So so that's a posterior, and this is probably more of a chronic posterior dislocation, I would imagine. And this particular kid, this probably isn't the first time this has happened. Okay, uh, shall we? Uh, coronal T1 and an axial PD fat set image. Um, and then on the T1 weighted image, there's a high signal intensity within the this posterior. So is that this infraspinatus? Okay. And then there's also corresponding high signal intensity on the PD fat set. So um, some uh, edema or hemorrhage within the muscle. Um, and then the uh, humerus is posteriorly dislocated, and there's edema on the um, posterior medial aspect of the humeral head. So, so you should see glenoid uh, medial and oblique coronal images, and there's no glenoid here. It's just the, uh, uh, the um, infraspinatus muscle. So this is on 62806. Seven, one, six. Okay. So a, so a few days later, yeah. Uh, so the patient's been relocated, um, and so we have axial uh, T1 and PD fat saturated images. Um, so again, the patient's been relocated. You still see the edema and the bony defect within the humeral head, and reverse those sides. Yep. And uh, there's there's this low signal intensity between the the lesser tuberosity and the and the labrum. Yeah. So, so this is uh, this is just what a reverse hill sax lesion looks like. Most of the time, when you see these, you'll see this view, and not this view. Uh, but uh, now you can just see what the progression is, and when you see this uh, characteristic uh, appearance then uh, you can raise the, the issue of a post, recent posterior dislocation with a reverse hill sac lesion. I'm not sure what that is. Okay, uh, Jonah, what do you think of this one? Sure, so we've got a 22-year-old uh, athlete uh, 16 days after an injury. Um, we've got an axial fat uh, image here. Uh, first thing that uh, catches my eye is this um, bone marrow edema of the um, anteromedial uh, humeral head. Um, and then if we look back at the uh, glenoid, it actually looks like we have some disruption uh, posteriorly. And then there's some kind of thickening and irregularity of that, I guess, anterior capsule. Um, all this would add up to another uh, posterior dislocation, I guess. And then an anteriorly here, we can see a tear of the anterior capsule, which is in the region of the middle glenohumeral ligament. So as we would suspect, this is a common, uh, a relatively common etiology for posterior labral tears. And uh, we all know why now. Um, uh, John? Yes. Uh, don't you also have to really uh, look for tears of the posterior capsule with anterior dislocation? Yes, if it's acute, especially first time, that's right. So it's kind of a reverse bank card kind of deal. Right, exactly. Okay, uh, let's see, uh, Jeff, what do you think? Yeah, this, yeah. Uh, trauma two months ago. So we have T1 coronal images of the shoulder. Uh, we see a, a, such a very large defect uh, in appears to be the superior uh, portion of the humeral head uh, uh, and also it yeah it, it also seeing a impaction injury upon the uh, looks like the inferior portion of the glenoid at least on this coronal uh, coronal image uh, so yeah, a lot definitely of uh, yeah. 
impaction injury. Uh, I, are these axi uh, I don't know if these coronal these are, axial images. This is axial and this is uh, sagittal. Oh, okay. So, so basically so, what here is a comminuted fracture of the, of the yeah. head and uh, with dislocation. So it's uh, interesting that this trauma was two months ago and they're just now coming to get imaging. Uh, and, and we can see extensive fatty atrophy of the muscles and hypertrophy of the subcutaneous fat here. I suspect that there was a, a nerve injury and loss of sensation here. Um, Maybe. If you look at all the atrophy, including the trapezius muscle, yeah. um, I suspect that that's why it wasn't picked up. Yeah, that sounds good. And, and obviously this will need a replacement. Right. Okay, uh, Max, what do you think of this case? So we have an um, axial, I presume that's a, a fluid-sensitive sequence on the left, that's proton density, and then the right is T2. And um, so, this, so irregular... This is a T1 and this is a PD fat. Oh, I'm sorry, T1, okay. So we have an irregular uh, posterior glenoid on the T1. Looks like there's a fracture there. It looks like the labrum is also displaced, and there is a sleeve, um, the preosteal sleeve is associated with it. So this is a posterior glenoid fracture with periosteal sleeve, uh, labral fracture with periosteal sleeve. Well, yeah. So, so what we're seeing here is a subchondral fracture, a tear of the labrum, displacement of the posterior capsule, and here is a part of the posterior attachment, but it's completely torn as well. Uh, off, uh, in this particular case. We also see that there's a little bit of edema anteriorly here. So what do you think caused this? Probably a posterior dislocation. Yeah, so I would be uh, very highly concerned about a posterior dislocation, but here you've got a bone injury, uh, so uh, as well as an articular cartilage injury uh, that might uh, impact the prognosis and the treatment of the patient. John, do you have any comment on this one? Oh, yeah, th th this would uh, need to be uh, fixed because uh, I, was, I, I don't know what the measurement is uh, of the separation of the uh, uh, glenoid uh, injury, uh, maybe three or four millimeters. Right. But uh, the, 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 that the, looks to me like there's a little posterior subluxation yes. of the head. Yes. And that has to be fixed. Good. Does that the 25% uh, rule still apply for posterior uh, no, dislocations? I, I don't really go for the 20% the, the rule, um, but uh, w when you have a subluxation, everything is discombobulated. It's not just uh, one item that you see. You have a, a stretch of the um, anterior capsule here. You have an anterior uh, con a contusion, probably a subchondral fracture of the anterior uh, head and neck, uh, the surgical neck, and uh, and you have a fracture that um, subluxation, uh, fra fracture um, separation of the uh, glenoid, um, so and, and the labrum. So all these put together, uh, this uh, should be fixed. And, and I don't think this is acute. I think this is. Subacute. Uh, I don't remember the exact timing on this one, uh, but uh, I don't know of any data concerning uh, any 25% uh, rule when it comes to posterior injuries, and uh, I think this one was surgically fixed. Oh uh, yeah, this, this is partially dislocated. It's subluxed, so yes, uh, you, you know it's it's. Uh, it is ideal time to do it, although I think it's already missed the boat a little bit. Uh, well, Dr. I, Cruz. I, I'm not at all sure that this is... Uh, well, you're, you're the radiologist, John, but yeah. there's no, no fluid in the joint, and, you know, it's kind of... Yeah. And, uh, and the, posterior, look, the posterior rim is very important because a lot of daily activities using the shoulder require support of the posterior rim, even more so than the anterior rim. So I, I would imagine that these have to be fixed when they're smaller lesions than anterior lesions. Yeah, we do everything with our hands in front of us. Yeah. And 
that that's how it is this okay uh, posteriorly so it's very very important to to, to not miss this yeah. and, and fix it max yeah so would it does even matter to whether consider the 25 percent surface area to be anterior posterior I mean it's still the glenoid and it's the surface area is going to be shortened so yeah, again, uh, does it even make a difference surface, it's not the surface area we're measuring with that rule it's the linear dimension where the fracture occurs right so if it's posterior and whether it's posterior anterior it still should be the same rule right because I mean no it's going to be unstable whether you're anterior or posterior no, because uh, I think smaller lesions may be more significant posteriorly than anteriorly. Okay. And, and it also depends upon the activity level. Uh, so a, a smaller lesion would need to be fixed in someone who is much more active. And, and separation is important. If, if there's um, more than a little bit of separation, uh, you have to fix it because that that, that shoulder joint is unstable. Yeah. Uh, and I, so that's why I, I I hate the percentages stuff. Uh, it drives me nuts. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting uh, old and cranky, I guess. <laughs> uh, let's see, who did the last one? Your turn. Okay. Um, just before I do this one, um. So if we have a glenoid fracture, is it better to say in the report just a measurement rather than a percentage regarding the fracture fragment? Or how do you best relay the information to your referring clinician? I give a measurement, percentage. Okay. Okay. All right. So history of posterior dislocation, so axial and uh, axial and coronal um, PD fat saturated images, and there's muscle edema within the teres minor or infraspinatus uh, yeah teres minor and in the deltoid um, so so with posterior dislocation be concerned for denervation injury of the axillary nerve uh, let's see and, and how does the axillary nerve enter that area and from the quadrilateral space. There you go. I knew you knew that. That's why I asked it. That. Okay, Jonah. Yeah. Well, we've got a couple uh, axial images here, and this uh, patient, and um, a couple things. Staff. I mean, there's probably some biceps stenosis and stuff like that, but we do see a posterior labral tear. Um, otherwise, there seems to be, you know, yeah, so there's there's the tear, um, and let's see, oh, and yeah, it looks like the uh, capsule is disrupted as, as well. So here's a posterior labral tear, uh, here's actually a posterior labral tear with actually capsular disruption as well in a different patient. So. Um, well, well, well uh, switching, many dislocations do not uh, necessarily tear the labrum. Right. Yep. And all that does, uh, they tear the capsule and they sublux. So you don't have to tear the labrum to have a dislocation. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jeff, what do you think of this case? Okay, so we have a 19-year-old male with recurrent dislocation, multidural joint stability, no trauma, and we have uh, looks like we have two axial and a uh, sagittal image. I think these are t uh, PD fat set um, MR arthrogram images, and within the posterior labrum, I see uh, an area of uh, hyperintense signal uh, that appears just. Uh, uh, within the, or just kind of in the superficial portion of the uh, uh, posterior labrum there. Uh, so the labrum itself doesn't appear to be displaced. Uh, and, uh, oh, pops a lesion. So this is a pops lesion. Notice that the periosteal attachment looks like it's intact here. So, so this would be mm -hmm. a posterior periosteal sleeve avulsion. I'm just pointing that out because these are words that people use. 
I never use this word in a report. And I, I don't really think whether the uh, labral attachment is intact or not is very important, at least according to the orthopedic surgeons I've, uh, I've talked to. If it's torn, it's torn, and if you have to, you have to go in and fix it. And it doesn't really matter what the periosteal attachment's like, uh, as we talked about anteriorly. John, do you have any comments on that? Uh, yeah, uh, this reminds me of voluntary dislocating um, with no trauma. Patients are extremely difficult to deal with, and you never, ever, ever operate on these. Uh, what happens is they, any procedure you do, they'll break it down by testing it. And uh, when you have a 19-year-old male, usually it's a, a female that has this problem. And um, you just let them do what they want to do, just tell them not to do it. If, if, uh, but they usually don't listen to you. Yeah. So put them, on the, put, put them on an exercise program or something like that. Um, I'm not, you know, th that, this looks like there's some, some pathology. Yeah. Most of these folks don't have any pathology. They, yeah. they just uh, voluntarily dislocate their shoulders, usually, usually posterior. Yeah, I think it's what John is really talking about are, are, are voluntary subluxors. I don't know if any of you have known anyone like that. I've known a couple of people, and it, they can usually do it bilaterally. Uh, some of them probably have some sort of an Euler-Danlos type uh, variant uh, where they're just extremely loose, and they can and they can sublux uh, at will uh, whenever they want. And I've known a number of them that have gone to doctors. And as John was saying, uh, they, it's a disaster when you operate on those. Now, we used to have uh, these patients come back to our interesting case clinic once a year, or once a month, I don't remember now, and uh, show us how they can do it. Uh, they would voluntarily dislocate for us, and, uh, you know, the, the residents would want to operate on them, and of course you'd never do that. So. But uh, we, we had um, um, a few of these at UCLA when I was a resident and, and a staff. Um, so just regarding the, the morphology of the posterior labrum, it looks like it's serpiginous, this signal. Is that a paralabral cyst component of it as no, well? No, that's, that's actually the tear. That's just the tear between the capsule and the periosteum and the labrum. Yeah, well, the, the labrum, it's in the labrum. Periosteal attachment is over here. This is all labrum in this location. So this is just a tear in the labrum, and here's the periosteal attachment. Okay, so it's going between the labrum and articular cartilage? Uh, the articular cartilage is over here, and that area looks pretty good. So it's more in the body of the, of the posterior labrum. And then uh, uh, this just shows the, the periosteal attachment to be intact from the literature. And so the different kinds of lesions we've seen are the bank cart, where the periosteum is also torn, the alps lesion, where they're displaced and scarred down anteriorly, Perthes lesions, where the uh, periosteal attachment is intact, reverse bank cart posteriorly, and then the pops lesion back here. Uh, this comes from Dr. Su in uh, South Korea, but these look like they're David Stoller's images that uh, Salvier Beltran probably uh, drew these. Okay. Just remember, Perthes is not recognized in the modern literature. In the, in the orthopedic literature, right. Or, orthopedics. Right. Uh, and, oh, the, uh, the newcomers in orthopedics will not know what you guys are talking about. Okay, okay thanks, John. Uh, Max, what do you think of this one? Okay, so we have a axial T1 and... Uh, I believe that's a PD fat set on the right. Uh, we have thickening. Let's see here. We have um, uh, thickening of the posterior glenoid. Um, and uh, we have some, uh, yeah, so there's that one. Blunting of the posterior plus some thickening, the dark signal. Uh, anteriorly, we also have some. Are you talking signal. about this? Yes. That's not the yes. glenoid. Oh, that's, that's just the. Uh, 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 the capsule, giving us just a thickened capsule we're looking okay. at? So this is the posterior labrum. That's a tear in the posterior labrum. 
This is the periosteal attachment. Wow, that looks really dark and thick like a Right. Hey, it's like, like, a like what we saw in some of those lesions in the anterior. And this is another POPs lesion. Uh, but again, basically... Oh, it's calcified, yeah. Yeah, it was, well, I don't know if it's calcified. Sometimes it can calcify. Uh, and then it's called a Bennett lesion. Uh, I'm not sure whether this one's calcified or not. But this is just that chronic thickening, and we saw it develop fairly rapidly in six weeks in that anterior uh, Perthes lesion that we saw in the anterior. And this is just a posterior one. That's scar tissue. That's scar tissue. So uh, let's see, why don't we end with this one? Uh, are we having breakfast tomorrow, John? Uh, why don't we finish this case, John, and then we can discuss that. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought you were done. We have a radiograph with the axillary view of the right shoulder. And um, on the, I guess, this anterior aspect of the glenoid, there's this curvilinear density. Posterior. Uh, posterior aspect? Oh, that's right, because the coracoid's anterior. That's right. So the posterior aspect of the of the glenoid, this is curvilinear density, which... Okay, so then um, axillary, uh, I'm sorry, uh, axial views, uh, T1 and PD fat set in the patient who's had an arthrogram, and there's thickening along the posterior um, glenoid, um, which is could correlate with this focal area of calcification. Um, is this a baseball player? Uh, I don't remember. Okay. This, this, and this is basically the same pathology as the last case we saw. This one just have an x-ray showing that this is calcified. And uh, it's not, not easy to tell whether these are calcified or not just on the MR examination. Uh, but this is called a Bennett lesion, and it's just a chronic posterior uh, uh, labral tear. So why don't we stop here today. And uh, any questions? Okay, uh, we still got a ways to go on instability of the shoulder. I, I have a question.